close, Jamie, close, but you weren't first. According to my records, the administration has called Lucifer Almighty first. But you gotta earn them. This is not a socialistic channel. <laughs> Oops. Bye bye. Some people already left. You gotta earn your points here. <clears throat> this uh, debate, I don't know how to put this gently, but it just. It was like a douche, 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 in my opinion. And I know that will offend a lot of Christians, because they're probably thinking. A lot of Christians probably think that Tom Jump is just a, an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He did very poorly against Jonathan McClatchy. Um, you know, it, this is why I I, I I like debates, but yet I don't like it because it's just whoever, whatever team you're on seems it seems that's your your winner, right? But I I want to try to point out some uh, mistakes Tom made. Uh, I don't think he made too many. And I want to make some comments, um, some mistakes that I think Jonathan made. And the topic was, uh, I think this happened two days ago? Or was it last night? Was it last night? No, no. It's actually four or five nights ago. Um, the topic was, does God exist? And I'm definitely not going to play everything because it's way too long. I'm going to try to shoot for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes worth of... Um, of, it, of the debate and then make comments on it. So we'll see if we can do this in an hour or <laughs> hopefully under two hours. Is that lead to their, their construction. Um, also, I think is, um, uh, is um, probabilistically prohibitive um, on the Darwinian scenario. Uh, if you imagine here, we have uh, the, the Zyg. Okay, uh, I gotta introduce this. Um, what, what Jonathan's trying to do here is he's trying to say, okay, what's the probability that atheism is true? Or let's, what's the probability of atheism, uh, given that we have something called a moral arena, uh, uh, the idea that people, uh, sentient beings, can act moral or do make wrong choices with each other. What's the probability of that under atheism? And what's the probability of that under theism? Hey, thank you so much, Mark. Is this where I send my dues to join the bowling league? <laughs> Uh, well, I, um, I'm not going to take your money unless you're a good bowler. Uh, got to have an average of 225, 225 at least. So this is, uh, Jonathan's strategy for this whole debate was to, oh, you can't see it. Hang on. I, I yeah, 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 I'm on it. <laughs> um, his, his whole strategy was to show how that the probability of atheism is smaller than the probability of, um, theism. And each step, he assigned a certain probability. And I'm not going to play all of it, but I'm going to start it at 2023, where he talks about, I think he's at two body plans, something like that. Let me see here. That lead to their, their construction. 
Um, also, I think is um, uh, is um, probabilistically prohibitive um, on the Darwinian scenario. Uh, if you imagine here, we have uh, the the zygote or the fertilized egg, um, and uh, on leading to the the um, adult form capable of reproduction. This is C. elegans, which is a roundworm, to a very well-known model organism in the biological sciences. Um, what is the uh, to go from the zygote to the to the um, final form capable of reproduction? You need to go through this developmental cascade. It basically works through a process of sub of um, of um, cell differentiation and specification. Um, there's different types of cells, different, different jobs, and uh, the first cell divides into two, and then into four daughter cells. Okay, now listen, this is the important part coming up. So he's basically painting a picture of this is really complicated, complex stuff to go from a single cell to a um, complex organism. 16 and so forth, and it's a very complicated uh, process. But notice that you have to go all the way from the zygote all the way to the um, adult, the, the, the form capable of reproduction. If you stop midway across that developmental pathway, you don't have a live organism, you don't have a viable organism, you have a dead organism. You have to get traverse all the way across. But what are the odds that a process lacking foresight could produce such a developmental pathway? I, I this is the part I wanted to, to show you guys. To me, this is like one of those best bits. He's, he's saying this is very complicated and what uncomplicates this or what makes this more likely? Listen what he what he says here. What are the odds that a process lacking foresight could produce such a developmental? What's the odds that a process lacking foresight could do this? This is so complex. The only thing you need to do this, according to Jonathan McClatchy, is foresight. But what kind of explanation is that? How exactly does Yahweh, I'm uh, sorry, how exactly does a God's foresight make this any easier? Please explain it to me, someone. How does foresight make going from a single cell to a complex organism any easier, any more probable? Can you explain it to me? What's the mechanism of foresight? This is um, what Tom Jump hammered home with uh, Jonathan McClatchy throughout this whole debate. And that, that is that Jonathan McClatchy's whole thing was an argument from ignorance. I can't understand how this is even possible if there is no God. Like, you need, you need a guider. You need foresight for this to happen. I, I can't imagine it happening without this foresight. So therefore, it's more likely that God exists. This is an argument for making ignorance. Pathway. I, I think it's very improbable on the hypothesis of atheism. But just hey, guys, let me know if uh, if you can hear hear it all all right because I know it's low in volume. You want need me to pump up the volume? Hey, thank you, Edgar Ecuri Ecure Ecuri. I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but thank you so much for that nice donation. Just for the purpose of argument. I'm just going to assert that the probability of such developmental pathway emerging on atheism is something less than 0.1%. Um, what though about uh, the origins of uh, consciousness uh, in the cell? Um, uh, sorry, consciousness in, 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 uh, in co conscious embo in embodied agents, sentient, sentient life forms. Um, uh, note, notice that there's there's nothing in known physics that would allow someone to look at the brain and conclude you know there there's someone in there uh this this thing has first person ex see uh jonathan kept pushing back this is not an argument from ignorance it's not an argument from ignorance but listen closely to what he says here note notice that there's there's nothing in known physics that would allow someone to look at the brain there's nothing in known physics that will allow someone to look into brain and conclude you know there there's someone in there uh, this this thing has first person experience. Yeah, science can't do that. Science can't look into the brain and, and see that there's someone in there experiencing this this qualia. So therefore, it's more likely there's a god, right? This is an argument from ignorance. Experiences. So we can't predict consciousness by way of physics and seeing the brain. Now, one might be tempted to think here that only brains with subjective experiences would avoid pain and so forth, and so we can predict that consciousness would evolve because it's adaptive. But that's also um, incorrect because only people who believe in souls think the mind can affect the brain like that. Almost all atheists would say that your brain would do what it does even if no consciousness existed because it's a physically closed machine. All your neurons would fire just the same without you. 
and move your body the same way. Evolutionary history would be identical without subjective experience. Um, but for the purpose of our argument, I'm just going to say that the probability of consciousness emerging on atheism is 0.1%. Okay, now this is... <laughs> it's, it's good that he put for the sake of argument. But he's building, he's building a mathematical Bayesian-type model here. But then he says, for the sake of argument, I'm going to say that the probability of consciousness, given naturalism or given atheism, let's say, is 0.01, no, 0.1%. He's saying that it's possible. <laughs> that reminds me of the, was it Dumb and Dumber video? Hi, Kaylin. Glad you could make it. Uh, is it the Dumb and Dumber video where uh, Jim Carrey's character says to a woman, you know, what's the odds of, of you going out with me? And she says, like, one in a million chance that I'll go out with you. And he smiles and says, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> so it's, it sounds like Jonathan's saying there's a chance that you can have consciousness without any deity at all. But he says, just for the sake of argument. And then, of course, we need um, the, moral, the origins of moral sensibilities um, in these sentient creatures, um, which I'm also going to assign a probability of 0.1%. I think being very, very generous each step in the process here. Um, yeah, he, he, he admits that it's generous to assign 0.01% to consciousness and even morality. Um, but he has to put some numbers in because it has to be non-zero. But... I, w I want you to remember this, guys, because later on, he's going to admit, not so much with consciousness, but he's going to admit that he just presupposes that morality can only exist, objective morality can only exist under theism. Um, and I'm going to be charitable, of course, and assume that these are the only things the atheist needs for a moral arena. Now, let's multiply the upper bound of all these numbers. To okay, now, uh, tip for Jonathan, if you ever hear this. People are going to look at that chart that you have up here, and they're just going to, their brain's going to shut off. Like, maybe some math geeks will love this and say, oh, the probability of universe uh, laws, etc., given atheism and goes that, life permitting given a universe. I tell you the truth here. Um, <laughs> a large percentage of people don't care about that. Um, they're not going to, they're just going to shut off. So basically, what Jonathan's goal here is saying, well, under atheism, would you expect a universe? Would you expect life-permitting universe, given a universe at all? Would you expect an origin of life, given a life-permitting universe? Would you expect uh, the molecular machines, given the origin of life, and blah, 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 and as you go down the line? But you notice, Jonathan, I'm a little disappointed in you. You could have added at least three or four more lines in there and got the prob probability even lower, couldn't you have? Like... Um, I think you could have done that. But I want to show you, Jonathan, what the reason why what you just did here is not persuasive. And I just made this in, um, in like five minutes. <laughs> I made this in five minutes before the show. Um, and I'm going to use the same strategy as Jonathan McClatchy on showing that the probability of atheism is um, higher, if equal, if not higher, than the probability of theism. And that is... <clears throat> What's the probability of this universe with all its wasted space, black holes, and dark matter, cold, dark chaos existing given theism? I'm going to be generous and give that 0.1%. Uh, What's the probability that only 4% of our universe and far, far less is life permitting given theism? I'm going to give that, be generous, 0.1%. What's the probability that the origin of life came from a very slow and inefficient process called evolution via common descent given theism? I'm going to give that a low probability of point. 1%. What's the probability that we would have 90% of all life existing now, of all life existing now extinct? In other words, 90% of all the life that's ever existed is now extinct. What's the probability of that given theism? That seems like a waste of life. I'm going to be generous and give that a 0.1%. What's the probability that some animals would need to eat each other to survive, or that we would excre ex excrete foul, odorous poop? I just got to put my hand in front of my mouth. Poop. <laughs> so I don't, see if I go poop, it will poop. What's the probability that there's a God given that there's poop given theism? <laughs> I'm going to be generous. And given that there's poop in the universe given theism, um, 0.10%. 
What's the probability that we would have useless internal organs like the appendix or wisdom teeth given theism? I'm going to say 0.1%. What's the probability that children could be born with bone cancer or children could be born without even skin on their body? It's pretty painful. 0.1%, I'll give it. I'll be generous. And what's the probability that a volcano or a hurricane can kill thousands of people at random given theism? I'm going to give that a 0.1%. So you see what I'm doing here, Jonathan. If you multiply all those probabilities, the probability of theism, given all those things I just listed, is less than 1 times 10 to the negative 24. Done. You see how that works, Jonathan? And that's basically what you did here. Now, I don't know if I should, yeah, I'm just going to keep, keep the ball rolling here. Okay, I'm going to, so that was Jonathan's opening statement, basically, in a nutshell. And um, I'm going to skip Tom's opening, because if anybody here is a fan of Tom's, you've, you've heard similar things before. Yeah, I think I'm going to go to start at John's rebuttal. Yeah, that will save some time. 3210. By the way, uh, Tom's opening was very good. Um, you met. You started off by saying that uh, that there might be a god, but uh, but definitely the the Christian God does not exist. Um, Okay, but we're not debating whether the Christian God exists this evening. I mean, that's a topic in its own right. I'd be happy to do that on a future occasion. I have done it with other opponents. Um, but this evening, we're debating specifically, does God exist, which is a much more minimal claim. And so I'd like to actually stick with the topic rather than add, adding auxiliary hypotheses, um, which are interesting to discuss. And I have discussed them in the past, but that's not the topic of this, the, the debate this evening. Okay, so... Um in Tom's opening statement, he basically said that, uh, you know, there might be a God out there existing, some, you know, deistic type God. Um, but that basically the God of the Bible definitely doesn't exist. I think um, Tom was pretty, used that strong language. And Jonathan's saying, hey, we're not talking about the biblical God here. We're talking about just a God in general. But I've listened to this, Jonathan's opening statement, I think twice now. Hey, Daniel Vlad... Daniel Valadio, Daniel Valadio, $15. Thank you so much. Uh, I've listened twice, and I don't think Jonathan ever defined so far. So far, he has not defined what a God is. And this is important. Um, he's, he's saying that, you know, we're not necessarily talking about the God of the Bible. But I think if pressed for a definition of God here, like, you got to know the definition of God if you're arguing, does this God exist? I think if you get a definition from Jonathan McClatchy, he's going to end up defining the God of the Bible, the attributes that usually go with that God, like all loving, all, all good, uh, creator God, all powerful, all knowing, maybe. I don't know if he'd go all, yeah, I think he would go all knowing. Um, you mentioned uh, the God of the gaps, like the, such as the, the... Okay, so I'm gonna, so I want you to remember that, that the definition of God so far has not been clear. Um, but it's, it seems pretty obvious that Jonathan, in the depths of his soul, <laughs> is seeing Jesus when he thinks of God or Yahweh. Okay, I'm going to fast forward here to, oh yeah, this, oh, this is where, uh, oh no, this is not it yet. This is Tom's rebuttal. We're in the Tom's rebuttal now. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff because of time. Let's go there. Oh, thanks so much. The floor is yours. All right, I'd like to start by saying, yes, every version of the intelligent design argument is an argument from ignorance. Every single one of them. All of them. No matter what. Uh, they're essentially just saying, here's something we can't explain with natural causes. We're going to make an argument from analogy to intelligent design, therefore intelligent design. Argument from ignorance straight off the bat, no matter what. In every case, from every field, in every, every level of academic, it's all an argument from ignorance. Um, I really like that what Tom just said. Now, this is really going to tick off a lot of Christians. But I agree with Tom here. And even when I was a Christian, I, it slowly started to sink in like, oh, man. And, and, and some Christians 
will admit, well, some the presupp- presuppositional Christians will definitely admit this. They'll, they'll say, I have um, guys like Saitan Brunkate on record of saying that the Kalam uh, cosmological argument is terrible and, and all these arguments are terrible because the, you can easily ask questions like, well, how do you know that our universe began to exist if you define the universe as the cosmos and everything? Maybe there was something before our universe and so forth. So some Christians will admit that these philosophical arguments are on their own not strong and that you need a bunch of them. You just got to put a whole bunch into the pot of soup and stir it all together and hope you get a cumulative effect of a sweet smelling argument. Um, But basically, I agree with Tom here that I can only think of maybe one exception and that's maybe the ontological argument. But all the other arguments are basically a form of an argument from ignorance. No, uh, Jonathan got it wrong. Uh, My argument is that naturalistic pantheism is the one and only criteria I'm using to explain all of the data. Every one of the arguments can be explained by naturalistic pantheism just like they can be theism, so it has equal explanatory scope and equal explanatory power in every respect. Okay, now, yeah, so naturalistic pantheism is brilliant of Tom to use, and I call it the outsider test of faith for deism, really. And you know how... um, if a Christian says to you, um, well, I know Jesus is real because I've experienced him in my life. I, I felt his presence um, on such and such a date. Um, this happened to me, and it, it's not a coincidence. This is Jesus working in it, God spoke to me. You know, you've, you hear things like that. And all you, it's very easy to combat such a reason for the existence of this deity in their life by saying, well, does that mean that um, a Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, a Mormon, when they have experiences that that means that their version of God exists? And they say, of course not. But when it happens to me, then it works and it's good evidence. But when it happens to them, it, it, it becomes, they'll either see it and see that, oh, this outsider test for faith, yeah, it's not working for me. They'll either see it or they'll just special plead. And, um, and say, well, I just know. I just know it works for me. I just know that Jesus is, is in my life. And that outsider test for faith, that version, is what Tom is doing here using naturalistic pantheism. He's saying, hey, look, Jonathan, you're saying that you need a God for this, this moral arena. You need a God to explain consciousness. You need a God to go from that single cell to that um, multicellular organism. Um, well... Wouldn't you know, I got an explanation for that too. It's called naturalistic pantheism. It can explain all that. We don't need your God. We don't need any God for that. So take that. So it's, um, but the way, the way I would ask it, if you're talking to a person on the street, talking to your friend, um, I would ask it in the form, see, this is the difference between Tom and me. Tom will just come out and make an assertion and, and <laughs> risk even putting people down and making people feel stupid. Um, I would rather form it, put it in the form of a question and say something like, well, okay, you believe that there's a God existing because of the Kalam cosmological argument or the moral argument or whatever. Um, how did you figure out, figure out is a good way to, put, to say it, how did you figure out that there wasn't just something like naturalistic pantheism that ex- explains... Um, how our universe came about. How did you figure out that, that, how did you remove that as a possibility? And of course, uh, Christians who have thought about this, they'll, they'll have an answer. But it's, it, it's one of those things that we, we really don't know. We really don't know. And uh, Christians like, and other theists cl- like to claim they know, but we really don't. And I, I would say I don't know that there is no God uh, either. We really don't know. We should be, the origins of life and stuff like this, um, consciousness, we have to sometimes admit that we're like, um, we're like a cat on a unicycle trying to learn calculus. Like is this, some of these things are just so complex that maybe we'll never know. Putting the prior probabilities can be equal in everything or better in everything. So. That, so he, he was incorrect when he was characterizing naturalistic pantheism that way. Naturalistic pantheism is just an eternal, all-powerful nature. 
So God's properties are eternal, all powerful, all knowing, conscious, personal. Uh, See, now look, listen, I think this is the first time uh, a God has been defined, and Tom is defining it, not Jonathan. And let's see uh, if we see, see uh, the head nod, yes or no here. So God's properties are eternal, all powerful, all knowing, conscious, personal, um, and all good. So if we just take naturalistic pantheism, it's just two of those six, seven properties. And so if naturalistic pantheism is untenable or unplausible, then God is by definition necessarily more untenable or unplausible because it's only using properties of a God. That's, that's brilliant, what Tom just did there. Because uh, it's a bit of a Occam's razor. You take the most the simplest ex explanation if it can do just as well in explaining things. And um, Tom uses naturalistic pantheism as a as an outsider test for faith and say, hey, this is just an all powerful. Is it just all powerful? What what did he say? Two of those six, seven properties. And so if naturalistic pantheism is untenable or unplausible, then God is by definition necessarily more untenable or unplausible. Because yeah, so it's just that naturalistic, the na nature is just all-powerful, uh, and it's, it's necessary. Yeah, those are the two things. It's not contingent. It's necessary, and it's all-powerful. And that's those, those are two properties that most people, a lot of theists, put, um, describe their God as. And so, but they also add on a whole bunch of other layers that they actually need to add on for other reasons. And so, hey, if those two can explain things, why do we need six or seven? And I think the, <laughs> the reason why they don't want is just say naturalistic pantheism could be a good option is because then they can't have this personal relationship if they're a Christian, or they can't have this form of justice if you're a Jew or Muslim. Because it's only using properties of a god. And by eternal, that could mean outside of space or time or whatever variation of eternal you want to put in there. So again, everything that you put in for the probabilities of Jonathan's argument can be, I can just, let's say grant all of that because that there are multiple different kinds of gods you have to multiply that probability by the possible number of potential gods, and then you get the probability of theism. So, like, for example, there could be a god that would... would not create life. And so the probability of life uh, just got cut in half under his model because there's a theist God who would create life and a theist God who would not create life. And there's possibly a God who would create black hole universes. I was just going to say, sorry, uh, Cam, Spires, if you're in the chat, uh, you, uh, if you want to come on and talk about Bayesian for a little bit, you, uh, let me know via Facebook. You just got cut in half again. Now you have 33% of whatever probability you assign to theism now or to atheism. Theism now has 33% less likely to produce life than an atheistic universe because there are these different variations of a god. And because there are essentially infinitely many variations of a god, there's infinitely much less likely to get a life in the universe with a god than without one. Okay, uh, what is... I think this might go um, past some people here. What is Tom saying? Uh, okay, so let's say um, God... Oops, no God. And let's say, let's say um, right now it's 50-50. We don't know anything. We just, it's arbitrary. It's like a 50-50 probability that's God, that there's a God or no God, or even gods, plural. What Tom is saying here is that ba depending on your definition of God, let's say you have um, Yahweh is one option. Let's say Vishnu is another, and, um, and a whole bunch of other gods like uh, Ganesh. Uh, Allah is actually a little bit different than Yahweh because, um, at least the Christian Yahweh, because um, there's no trinity in Allah. So these are different gods. Then you can have a god that... Um, uh, is stupid. <laughs> Actually, that's not harsh, but not all-knowing, let's say, and not all-powerful, like a, a weak god. Uh, or, the, or let's say you have a deistic-type god. 
What, uh, there's a whole bunch. So if we're starting with a 50-50, <laughs> yeah, I won't use black crayon. <laughs> what Tom is saying here is, hey, look, if we're starting with a proposition of a 50-50, uh, God versus no God, but with no God, you can't have different divisions here. There's just no God. And if you are defining, if you have a specific definition of this God, then that 50% has to be allocated to all these different gods. So he, if there was only um, one, two, three, four, five, here we have, well, let's get rid of Ganesh. Sorry, Ganesh. If we only have five gods here, Yahweh would get 25%. Oh, actually, yeah, 25%. Vishnu, 25%. Actually, 20%, because we've got five of these, and a deistic God. So we have 20% of each. So one-fifth. Now it's the, the probability of God versus no God has dropped to one-fifth compared to no God proposition. And that's what Tom is saying here. And, it, and he's right, because uh, what Jonathan's doing here is he, from the very start, is we're not talking about a specific type of God. We're just talking about any general God. Okay, if, that's what, if you're talking about any general type of God, maybe there's a God out there that, that isn't loving. Maybe there's an evil God. So now if you're comparing no God with an evil God and a loving God, well, you've got to share that 50% probability between the, the evil God and the good God. By the way, how, how do you define... You, that, that even idea of an evil God and a good God says that there's a standard of morality outside of this God, which is kind of weird. Okay. Let me go back to the debate. So I can essentially just grant Jonathan's argument and it works to disprove his position uh, that theism, that life is more likely under theism than under atheism. All he's done is make up a theistic God and say, well, if there's something that's going to design life, well, then life is more likely to occur. Well, I can just say, if naturalistic pantheism is determined in such a way to create a life permitting universe, then the probability of a life permitting universe under atheism is one in one. 100%. Or just I can, again, add in lots of random criteria to make it any number I want, like the 1% he presented for theism. No difference there. So his argument adds up to essentially nothing. Um, <laughs> See, this is where Tom and I are different. <laughs> I don't know if I would be that forceful. His argument adds up to essentially nothing. He, he said that the... Okay, I'm going to fast forward it here. Uh, let's see, 48. So this is Jonathan's second rebuttal. 48. 48, 35. Okay, close enough. The floor is yours, Jonathan. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom, once again uh, for that engaging rebuttal. Um, you mentioned that every ID argument is an argument from ignorance, completely untrue. Even if something's wrong with the arguments for design, it's certainly not wrong because it's an argument from ignorance, uh, because it makes a positive argument. And if you're making a positive argument, it, whatever else might be wrong with it is not an argument from ignorance. Uh, the argument for design is that there are certain features of biological systems in particular, which are best explained as a product of an intelligent source, and therefore um, we invoke intelligent source to explain their origins. Okay, so Jonathan's pushing back hard here that uh, the argument from design uh, various philosophical arguments for God. They're not arguments for ignorance, from ignorance. Um, and that we should, we should look at what best explains the data. So if you're comparing atheism and theism, we look at what best explains the data. And he believes that when you do that, you'll say that um, theism explains the data better. But remember earlier I played that... Um, well, I want to show you something here. Um, what best explains the data for morality? Now, I asked Jonathan this question. I asked him, if there were no God, if there was no God, what would explain morality? How would you define morality? So I'm going to skip to the Q&A section here. And I want you to listen very closely to his answer. I asked this question because basically, remember the bottom of his Bayesian thing, step by step, the bottom line was morality. So it was almost like an argument for um, the moral argument. We have objective morality, so therefore God. This was the question I asked him. 
Thanks so much, and thanks for Sister Pedro for your super chat. Next up, Pine Creek Gas. Question for Jonathan, your old sparring partner, Jonathan. This is yeah. how I... Jonathan and I have never sparred, really. I remember this, uh, John, uh, Pine Creek, I discovered through you, Jonathan, because I had seen you go on his channel, and uh, it was an interesting convo. So, uh, Pine Creek asked, if there were no God, how would Jonathan define morality? If there were no God, how would you, Jonathan, define morality? Now, remember, this is the guy who made that little step-by-step -step list in order to get morals... You gotta have a universe, it has to be life permitting, you have to have cells and molecules and consciousness, and then you know sentient beings so you can have morality. He gave a big list of all the things you need to have morality. And he gave a probability of, of this occurring, a probability under atheism of having all these things. So how would you explain morality if there were no God? And his answer is... If there were no God, how would I define morality? Um, I don't believe that mor morality can be objectively grounded apart from theism. Um, so I think theism is, I think morality itself or objective ethical norms itself presupposes a theistic worldview. Presupposes a theistic worldview. Now I've heard Jonathan in the past say he's not a presuppositionalist, that he's an evidentialist, that he believes because of the public evidence that's available to everyone for Jesus Christ, and so I, I got the impression that Jonathan doesn't really like presuppositionalism, that you just, you just assume it's true. You just presuppose this is the case. But it, he's admitting it here. He's saying, look, if there's no God, there's no objective morality. Case closed. We're done. He's presupposing that's the case. But then why go through all this effort to try to convince your fellow Christians or atheists or non-believers that, um, that there's good reasons for God because look, what's the probability of having morality under atheism? It's 0.01%, you said, or 0.1%. But really, you just define morality in such a way to say that, oh, there's no God, there's no morality. We're done. There's no God, there's no consciousness. We're done. But since we have consciousness, since we have morality, therefore there's a God. It's, if these arguments are not an argument for ignorance, they're definitely begging the question. They're defining words and terms in such a way, and, you're, and I think uh, Tom was right, that Jonathan's even defining God in such a way that, oh, it just has to be true. And Tom's saying, no, 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 I can define naturalistic pantheism in a way to make it work too. So now we're on a level playing field again. Okay. That's a bit of an aside. Uh, let's go back to where I was. I mentioned that every ID argument is an argument from ignorance, completely untrue. Even if something's wrong with the arguments for design, it's certainly not wrong because it's an argument from ignorance, uh, because it makes a positive argument. And if you're making a positive argument, it, whatever else might be wrong with it is not an argument from ignorance. Uh, the argument for design is that there are certain features of biological systems in particular which are best explained as a product of an intelligent source and therefore um, we invoke intelligent source to explain their origins. Um, so information content, for example... Yeah, but remember before, you're saying it's not an argument from ignorance, but yet when you were describing how you go from a single cell to a multicellular organism, Jonathan, you're saying this is a so complex, so detailed, that it cannot, that, well, how, what is the word you used? That there's nothing in science that can explain, you didn't use the word explain, I know you're very careful not to use that word, um, but there's nothing in science to demonstrate how this could be done without foresight. I know definitely use the word foresight, but now tell me, Jonathan, how exactly does foresight help you here? explain how how a, a, a singular celled life can go into multicellular organism how does foresight do it does foresight touch it in some way <laughs> and this is the thing like if you ask questions like this to a theist they, they don't like these types of questions like what's the explanatory power of foresight when it comes to a, a cell um because basically they're just going to say, well, just God did it. 
He just did it. I don't know, Doug, how he did it. He just did it. And as soon as you, that you hear them say, I don't know, it's an argument from ignorance. I don't know how, it, how it's done, but I just trust, I have faith that, uh, that he did it. Um, it, especially in digital form, is something that we habitually associate in every realm of experience with conscious activity or design. And so when we find information content in the form, uh, encoded in digital form, and turns it to the hereditary molecules of DNA and RNA, we infer the best explanation of that information is it too arose by virtue of an intelligent cause. And so it's, it's not an argument for ignorance, whatever else might be wrong with it, with the argument. Um, uh, so, so that's just, uh, is, is incorrect, I'm afraid. Um, he mentioned that every piece of evidence that I went over can be explained by naturalistic pantheism. Um, but uh, part of the, a key part of the argument was the goodness of God, God's moral character and God being, uh, uh, being... Okay, remember what he said at the beginning? That we're not talking about the God of the Bible. We're talking about does God exist? A general deism, a general... I don't even know what you call it. Uh, it's not the God of the Bible. So why are you defining this God as good, Jonathan? Like, you're defining this God in such a way to have the outcome go to your benefit, right? But I actually think even then it doesn't go to your benefit because we've got all this evil in the world. Well, and then he has to go to sin and all that sort of thing, get into the details of specific theism. But there could be an evil God, just a downright scoundrel God, there could be a God that exists that hates you, Jonathan. He hates you, but he created the universe. He is actually even the basis for objective morality, Jonathan, this evil God. And whenever you do something good, Jonathan, he's sad. But he didn't want robots, so he gave you the free will to do good. <laughs> Credit to Stephen Law morally morally good um, and thus uh, that that is part of the, the the reason why he plausibly has motivation for bringing out a moral arena um, a, a moral choice arena where people can shape and mold their character an evil god could have this an evil god could have the desire to have a moral arena where people can choose good or evil he just prefers they choose evil in moral significant ways um, so, so I, I would like to see how naturalistic pantheism gets on uh, um, with providing a, a plausible rationale for why uh, we would expect to see a, a moral arena on the hypothesis of naturalistic pantheism. And of course, to, to, um, I would argue that um, morality itself uh, presupposes uh, some sort of mind. Uh, morality itself presupposes some kind of mind. See, if you're talking about probabilities and evidence, explaining what we see, the evidence, this is the second time, although I'm going in a different order, that you've used the word presuppose. Jonathan, you've got to stop this. You're an evidentialist. If you're, no, if you're going to be an evidentialist, be an evidentialist and, sh and strike the word presuppose out of your vocabulary when you're using things like morality in your argument. You're using this in your argument. Presuppositions are like before arguments. They're your, like your foundation, your ultimate authority. But you're, you're just saying, oh, well, yeah, morality... Uh, presupposes God and um, yeah, minds presuppose God. Our consciousness, um, and I, I, I'd like to see how he um, defines naturalist pantheism. Uh, it, yeah, and I'd like to hear you, Jonathan, I still don't think you've defined God yet. I think uh, so far Tom Jump has defined God for you, but you haven't defined God. I think you've given, given hints, but you haven't given um, complete definition. In such a way. Um, he mentioned that uh, that there could be a, a god who would not create um, a, a universe and so the probability uh, or would not create life and so the probability has been cut in half um, etc um, that well uh, that could be true I, I didn't I, I argued that okay I want you to remember this he said that could be true that you could cut the probability of a god in half if there's two different competing gods I gotta write that timestamp down because I seem to remember him Going back on that, 5051, that could be true. Okay. In fact, I actually, in, in my argument, I granted that the, um, the probability of a moral arena existing on theism was low, 
I even said um, that for being conservative, I'll make it 1% probability on theism. I could even go further and make it 0.0001% and I would still have a very powerful argument for theism uh, based on the... No, no. Once you start dividing up that pie, that 50%, you got 50% God, 50% no God, and in the 50% God portion, you start cutting up that pie into a God who's indifferent, doesn't even care about morality, could care less, couldn't care less, or, and, and slice it up with a God that's evil, and then slice it up with a God that's uh, loving, uh, slice it up with a God who's not a creator. Uh, what, I, what I presented in my opening statement. So um, I, I don't buy that objection. Uh, he said, why do we need embodied beings? Uh, why couldn't we have um, like uh, spiritual beings? Okay, I'm going to fast forward it here to the section Tom's cross-examination. Um, this is where I think Tom made a lot of mistakes, actually. Yeah, 106.44. I want you guys to, I want to count. Uh, now, Tom's cross-examination, -exam, that's where Tom asks questions of Jonathan. He ex cross-examines, he interrogates, basically, Jonathan. And when it's Jonathan's turn, Jonathan interrogates Tom. But I want you to notice what happens here. And I'm going to keep track of how many questions Tom asks and how many questions Jonathan asks. Let's see, 106.44. Here we go. And so you asked about how pantheism can ground morality. Uh, so God grounds morality because it's a part of his nature, right? Right. So I can just say pantheism grounds morality because it's a part of its nature. Okay, but it, it seems to me that you're, I mean, you're, you, so can you, can you just give me a, de a definition of what you mean when you say naturalistic pantheism again? Eternal or powerful nature. Okay, and so how would you distinguish it from theism? It doesn't have consciousness. Okay, so so when you say naturalistic pantheism, do you mean that you... You see what's happening here? Tom, if... Uh, you'll probably watch the replay on this. Don't let Jonathan do this. You're the one asking the questions. Now, I know that sounds harsh, like, but you gotta, this is a debate format. This is not nice-nice. This is not uh, uh, a conversation, a regular type of conversation. This is cross-examination. The spotlight's on Jonathan. He should be, beads of sweat should be coming off his forehead. <laughs> you, you're asking the questions, not Jonathan. I, it's three to one so far. You're saying that the universe, because normally what people mean when they say pantheism is that, that God is the universe. No, that's an incorrect. Uh, that's one of the interpretations, but there's actually three branches of pantheism, the most common being the rejection of God. For example, if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, go down to the kinds of pantheism, the first one, number one, is physicalism, where it goes to the description of just the nat that natural pantheism is essentially a world where all there is is things that don't go outside of the bounds of what is ontologically uh, verified or, or granted okay. by science or something like that. So, so and if you, you go down to Clarify. If you go down sure. to the section on personal, it says Einstein was by definite was a pantheist who, by definition, rejected the idea of a personal god, and many pantheists identify that as the key feature of pantheism. There is no okay. So, so you said an uh, omnipotent universe, an all-powerful universe. Is that what you said? Yes, a powerful okay. eternal. Okay, and is it all-knowing as well, like God? No, no. Okay. it's just all-powerful. There's never okay. three. Okay. Um, and so, how would the how would this all-powerful? I mean, is, is this all-powerful universe necessary or is it contingent? Necessary. It's necessary. Okay, this is Tom supposed to be cross-examining uh, Jonathan. And so far, Tom has only asked one question. And I think we're up to six now with Jonathan. So, so just to make a distinction, the universe itself, like our universe, is not necessary. Our universe is a contingent thing created by the necessary pantheism. So it's kind of like the multiverse okay. where you have one small universe and then the bigger necessary thing behind it. Okay, so, so, it's, so it's another universe beyond our own, which is necessary. Is that what you're saying? Uh, sort of. It's, it's the... The, the word universe has multiple meanings in different fields. In philosophy, it means all things. In physics, right, okay. it means just the observable right. universe. And, and, is this, the... and is this universe that you're talking about governed by physical laws? No, our universe is governed by physical laws. Okay, so, so the universe you're describing, the one that you're attributing this natural sleep pantheistic property to, that, that does not have physical laws. It might, it might not. What governs it is unknown. So I would not... Physical laws are specifically only contingent to our universe, okay. and whether or not they apply to this thing is... Okay, now think about this for a second. What Jonathan's doing is asking... Well, how exactly is, is this, does this worldview work? How does natural pantheism actually work? Like, what's, what's actually going on here? And it, you could ask these questions, same questions, and Tom should be. Like, tell me, like, why is, is God's nature the way it is as opposed to something else? 
Like, why isn't God's nature the opposite of what it is, Jonathan? The nature that you believe in. Like, I know Jonathan's going for a generic type God here, but like, why couldn't God's nature be evil instead of good? Have you just defined it that way? And if so, I can just define my naturalistic, naturalistic pantheism this way. This is the brilliance of the outsider test for deism. And, and, and so does it have particles? Like protons, neutrons, electrons? Unknown. Those are only things know. that are continuing. So, so. How can God exist outside of time? How can God exist in negative time? How can God predict the future or see the future or know the future when he's outside the future or inside the future? How can God be personal and outside of time? You know, you can just keep asking these types of questions, drilling down, like, why is it that God does the things he does or allows the things he does or has, what are the reasons for, the, for what God does? How does foresight work uh, on, on helping evolution go? Um, whatever <laughs> Jonathan's answer is, Tom can just use the same answer for naturalistic pantheism. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I can't take your hypothesis seriously if you're not going to define it specifically enough for us to test it. Uh, and yet, coming from the man who still hasn't defined um, what God he's talking about here, he's, a, he's alluded to things like all good and all knowing, maybe, and all powerful, but. Like, we can't test God, so I just say the same thing well, to God. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I can give you a definition of God, um, whereas you're. Uh, you can, but do it. Give it. Every time I ask you something, uh, something about the definition of naturalistic pantheism, you're saying, well, we don't know. Um, oh, well, so, you could pick. You, you could just pick, say, no, okay. Right, so I, I, in this case, what I would do is I'd say, how do you answer it for God? I'm just going to copy that answer and apply that because there's a broad spectrum of what Nactus Pantheism could be, so it could be either way. Right. But I would try to go with whatever one is closest to your God that doesn't have conscience. So I would imagine you would say God is not made of particles. So for the sake of argument, I'll say no, Pantheism is not made of particles, and no, Pantheism does not adhere to the laws of physics. Or okay, so are, subject. Are, are you a naturalistic pantheist yourself? No. Now remember, this is still Tom's cross-examination. And Tom, you've only asked one question. This is like big, big no-no. Next time you debate, Tom, don't, when it's your cross-examination, don't let the other person ask you questions, at least maybe like one or two if it's a clarifying question, like what do you mean? But no, your, your job is to ask Jonathan questions. Then Okay, I'm going to fast forward this. Uh, oh, I think I found a timestamp where Jonathan finally does define God. Let's see here. I'm waiting. I'm anxious to see what, what, who this God is. Any right, possible which, variation? Well, sure. I mean, I, I'm, I'm only claiming that the argument uh, is provides you with, with strong support for generic theism. I mean, I'm not adding well, no, really right yeah, policies here. I don't think you're following. I'm, I think so again. Yeah. Like, what does generic theism mean? What is that? Yeah. In the number you come up with atheism, if you have to take that number and then you have to make... Oh, here it is. Remember what I said? I wrote it down. Timestamp 5051 where he says you can divide up different gods and get lower probabilities, that could be true. He said, and I quote, that could be true. This is where I think he contradicts himself, maybe. It's smaller for theism. So the probability of theism was necessarily lower than the probability of atheism, no matter what. That's my argument. Sorry, why is that? Because there's multiple kinds of a god. So you have to take, here's the probability of this universe under theism. And then you can say, well, there's a different okay. kind of theism. The probability of well, this universe well, sure, under I, this you, you, you mean like there's Christian theism and then there's Muslim Islamic theism and and so forth? Is that what you mean? Well, no, because those would all create the same kind of universe. So there would be a god that could create this kind of a universe with all of the same constants and all yeah. the same probabilities of a life as you described them, and there could be a god that could create a different kind of a universe. So like a god who create a non-life permitting universe, or a god who create black hole permitting universes, or only black holes, or a god right. who creates a universe just all of suffering. And so each one of those is a possibility of theism. And so if we look at those. Yeah, John, like, is, if, if you're not going to define what this God is, why couldn't there be an all-powerful God who just decided not to create the universe that we're in? Those possibilities, just arbitrarily, the probability of any one of those is one in three. Remember, you're talking generic theism. And so if we look at those possibilities, just arbitrarily, the probability of any one of those is one in three. The probability of a God creating a life from the universe, a God... A probability of a God created a non-life in the universe, and probability of God created just an abject immoral universe. Those are three kinds of theism, and just using prior probabilities of Bayesian epistemology, there's one in three, a 33% chance of all of them. And then you have to apply that to the, the universe you apply, which only can exist under the one of them. So you have to divide that number, whatever you came up with for the atheist universe, by three. 
Does no, that make I sense? Disagree. No, it doesn't actually. Um, so, so you see, now I can hear he disagrees. Now I could be wrong, but from the uh, let's see, 50 minutes, 10, 24 minutes ago, he agreed with Tom about that because we're talking about generic theism, and that slice of the theism pie has to be divided by all the different concepts of God. And he agreed with that at timestamp 5051. Now at timestamp 11357, he said, no, no, I, I disagree with that. One of them. So you have to divide that number, whatever you came up with for the atheist universe, by three. Does no, I sense? disagree. No, it doesn't actually. Um, so, so you, uh, you uh, so you, you had uh, the 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 argument was that God God has God is defined as omnipotent. So the, the argument is is for an, uh, is for a, um, you see how he is Jonathan is scared to define God because he doesn't want to be put in a box or in a corner. He's about to do it and he stops. What's going on? God is defined as omnipotent. So the, the argument is is for an, uh, is for. A, um, an all-powerful and all all good being, and because God has the ability to bring up a moral arena, and He also is perfectly good. Okay, so He defines it as God as all powerful and all good. By what standard do you say that this God is all good? See, no matter which way you turn, this is like it's terrible for the theists because if you define God as all good, um, then if I ask, well, what do you mean by good? And, you, and if you define that word good using that God, you just created a tautology, which means nothing. To say that God is all good means absolutely nothing if the definition of good comes from the nature of that God. It means nothing other than to say that God is God. Therefore, it's, it's, un, it's not totally, it wouldn't be totally unsurprising if you brought about... Uh, Jamie's saying it might be at 5051 he agreed with multiple gods in our universe, whereas now he's disagreeing with the possibility of gods who make different universes. Yeah, Jamie, you could be right. Or the more plausible explanation, he's, he really didn't understand Tom 20 minutes ago, but now he's starting to get it. A moral arena for the reasons I described in my opening statement. Um, and so even so, I, my argument doesn't even assume that the probability on theism is high. Um, it could be low for all. all the okay, uh, Cam Spires wants, wants in on this. Hang on, Cam. The problem is, Cam, if I let you in now, you won't be able to hear. Um, you won't be able to hear the sound. So you still want to come in? Well, I'm almost done. The argument cares, uh, but the the, o the only pertinent point is that the probability on theism is much more than it is on atheism. Okay, so you've defined a God as only being one that would create this kind of universe. You eliminate it and say no other kind of God could ever be considered a God. By your definition, the only thing that can be considered a God is one that would potentially create well, sure, this there, there, there are. Well, sure, there, there could be other, other gods that could create this universe. So? Well, so, so I mean, you, my, my, argument, my argument is only for God. I mean, hey, Cam. <laughs> um, hey. You, did you hear what I said on, on live stream that you won't be able to hear it if I let you in? I can hear it a little bit in the background, so... Okay. Might be okay. Well, I'll screen capture you in a bit. Let me just finish this. And uh, I think I just got two minutes left. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not really... I'm, right, right. My arms on the Sorry. Hot. So, so by your definition of God, you have excluded all possible gods that would not create this universe. You're saying those aren't gods by definition. Correct? Um, a, a God is a... Some, it, integral to, to being a God is being maximum. This is the hammer right here. This is the this is the three point shot at the buzzer right here. Listen, God, you have excluded all possible gods that would not create this universe. You're saying those aren't gods by definition, correct? Um, a, a god is a some it, integral to to being a god is being maximally good. Okay, so you've simply defined God as a thing that would create this universe. So I can just do the same thing and say naturalistic pantheism has this property which is makes it necessarily only contingent on creating this kind of a universe and make the probabilities the same. I can just say, well, okay, so the only possibility, if you're going to say that God is by definition something that would potentially create this universe, I can just say naturalistic pantheism is by definition something that would potentially create this universe and match your probabilities one for one. But the, 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 the point is that it's, it's, it's an argument for a maximally good being. I mean yeah, well, it's an argument for a maximally good being. We, and you have no way to define what good is. Do you, Jonathan? It, does, it doesn't, uh, and, and, and you know, a very powerful being to, be, to have the ability to bring about such a moral arena. So it, 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 I'm not arguing against you all the properties of God, and, um, so I'm, I, and I'm not quite sure how your naturalistic pantheism is differing from 
theism, and it seems that in order to have, in order to, to be maximally good, you would have to have some conscious mind to, to be able right, to discern. Let me clarify. Good. Yep. Okay. All right, let me clarify. So you have made up a property of all good. You've said your God has this property of all good, and having this property makes it likely that he's going to create this kind of a universe. I can just make up a different property. doesn't matter what it is. I'm just going to reject your definition of all good and say there's property X. And say this property X makes a likelihood of the universe likely. The universe has this property X, therefore a likelihood of the universe is likely. Okay, that's time. That's time. Okay, let me unmute you, Cam. So did you watch this live when it happened? Uh, thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, what did you want to say about the Bayesian thing? Um, I mean, I think that uh, when Tom is attempting to work from within the epistemic framework that McClatchy puts forward, so like... McClatchy is deliberately arguing um, by using probabilities and Tom kind of steps into that realm and works within it. And then he uh, makes, I think, a, um, a correct argument about how it is that the theistic space, as you add propositions, gets divided in probability among those mutually exclusive propositions. And, uh, consequently you know lowers the prior of such a god and then he correctly points out that there is an aspect about his uh naturalistic pantheism that actually uses less properties and so is therefore more probable intrinsically now um and he I don't think got McClatchy to understand how it is that he can just play the same game, but I think it was at least pre like, you know, apparent to some people in the audience. Um, but it's interesting though, because I don't think that Tom actually accepts this epistemology, even in the debate at some point, he makes quite clear that he thinks that this whole process of assessing priors um, in virtue of like additional properties, like the absence or presence of them is an invalid methodology. And I think he said it's like, he effectively said it was like garbage or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think I disagree with him on that. Um, I think that like one can be, justified in holding like unequal credences in two propositions on the basis of their intrinsic properties. But um, I thought that he did, a, it was a good choice of him to like step inside Jonathan's point of view because, and critique it from within. Because if he didn't do that, it would have just been this debate of him going, nah, uh, you can't like, you can't assign priors because they're not empirically derived or et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah. And uh, this is why I think it's, it should be called what Tom's doing should be called the outsider test for deism. <laughs> and I think Jonathan thought that he was scoring points by bringing up, Oh, you don't even actually believe this yourself, Tom, you don't, you're not a naturalistic pantheist. So, but the thing is, Jonathan doesn't really believe what he was espousing either because he was doing a, yeah, a, yeah he was doing a generic type of theism, not like what he was doing was, a guy like Sai Ten Brunke would say is um, is sin. He's even entertaining the thought that there could be gods other than his own. Like you don't do that. <laughs> so yeah, I find the um, the the way in which the God hypothesis is gerrymandered doesn't really believe what he's such espousing. That the either, only ones we're considering because... are those that create a universe like this, and there being an absence of really any concrete argument that shows how some certain concept makes the prediction that this is what we would expect to see. I find that to be like worthy of scrutiny. And it seemed like Tom did actually engage in that a bit. He did start to dig into like um, how um, goodness is effectively arbitrarily defined such that it brings about this universe. Did, did you see what I did, um, how I mimicked what Jonathan did with the, you know, his step step thing down to moral area. yeah uh, i th i thought there were a couple of opportunities to critique there like in particular one of the ones that you used was um uh, evolutionary history and it's you know waste or like how it's not really the type of thing you would expect um at least it certainly isn't the only way life could be created by an all-powerful deity uh if such a thing is coherent 
but then you additionally used um uh you you brought up a secondary thing which i thought was just encapsulating the exact same property oh yeah it was like just saying the same thing twice yeah you gotta keep in mind i did this like in uh five minutes before this show (laughs) no but it's a great illustration and i think that this is one of the troubles that people don't understand about bayesian arguments bayesian arguments actually force you to consider all evidence not just a subset like epistemically in order to deliver a judgment about um like the total evidence and how it affects your um, hypotheses or whatever you have to contain you have to consider all of it and so as soon as you begin for example doing this process of pointing out examples of things that may not be expected on jonathan's form of theism it's really just like a reverse moral arena argument and it in fact some portions of it i thought ended up being an argument uh for the, an evidential argument uh from evil yeah it basically was um i i was channeling my inner sean carroll when i did that because he has a great presentation where he says like seriously w- would you expect this if you're picturing this all loving all good all powerful all great god like seriously like 90 96 percent dark matter and dark energy really <laughs> yeah yeah th- there seems to be um another thought is that there seems to be a lot of content involved in the specification that the types of life that will be produced will be these embodied agents and it's not clear at all to me like where jonathan gets that from like why is like ha- why to, to me, it seems just as expected on the assumption that God exists, like a Christian God, that this God would create uh, just soul-like agents without a body as it is that we would create embodied agents, you know, via this very complex evolutionary mechanism that I think Jonathan rejects. But yeah. You know what I think? I think uh, Jonathan talked to Luke Barnes before he... <laughs> Did this did you see did you hear some luke barnes coming through i heard a little bit but i've also seen this presentation from jonathan before okay um so it, it maybe the conversation took place like a while back in time but i think he presented something similar to this on a modern another instance on modern day debate or um anyway i i think i've i've seen this moral arena argument elsewhere but he basically admitted for the sake of argument i guess that the probability of this moral arena under theism is small. But atheism is even smaller. So therefore, choose theism. Yeah. I mean, I, going back to what I was saying earlier, it does seem valid to focus on some particular subset of evidence if you think it's really strong. But you just need to acknowledge that you're opening yourself up via this form of like evidential reasoning to just easy counter objections like what you provided a, you know, anybody can create a laundry list of things that are unexpected on a hypothesis versus another. Yeah. Yeah. Just by adding a few more lines in that chain of events changes the probability greatly. Like why not two more? Why not three less? Like, I, I think, but even, yeah, I think that, oh, you go. I was just going to say, I think Christians can see through this. I think a lot of Christians uh, who watch this on the replay or, or watch it live, they can say, you know, I'd, come on, Jonathan, this is not why I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus because he loves me. <laughs> yeah, oh, but don't, don't forget, this was an argument for God and not for Christianity. <laughs> oh. um, so... Channeling Carol, Sean Carroll again, I do think it's worthy pointing out that um, this God concept by Jonathan doesn't seem to be well defined. You know, he's attempting to play what I consider to be a game in evidential reasoning that we practice in science using these probabilistic methods and you know observations that are unexpected on hypotheses but one of the unique things about science is that we have well-defined theories that make clear predictions that is we can take this mathematical machinery and derive from it expectations of what we will 
observe in the world in this really clear and transparent way that anybody can reproduce. I think that this is disanalogous with the God hypothesis. And I think that gods are more nebulous theories that don't have clear entailments. And in fact, um, that's one of the ways in which uh, you can go about avoiding evidence against your hypothesis by just shifting it and shimmering it and being like, oh, no, that's expected, you know, and because it's not this uh, precise game like we have in science, um, it, you know, you can get away with it. 707AR15 uh, says, asks, Doug, how does asking why is sin bad? So this is a bit of an aside. Actually, I'll try to tie it together. Um, hang on. He's asking, why do I ask the question, why is sin bad? Why does it expose a flaw or weakness in the theist view of beliefs? I actually think the question, why is sin bad, is, uh, if I do say myself, a brilliant one. Because <laughs> it gets to how the theist articulate their moral view. And so if they say sin is bad because God says so, well, why is doing what God says, why is going against what God says bad? And so you can get, when you keep on layering the onion and go deeper and deeper and deeper, it will end up probably, not always, but probably being about pain and pleasure. Because if you don't obey God, he's going to fry you, or he's not going to let you into heaven, which means he's going to fry you because he controls the gate into heaven. And, or you can't live with him forever, or something like that. Uh, or you'll live a better life if you obey God. You won't get sexual transmitted diseases as much. <laughs> um, and another reason why I ask that question, why is sin bad? Because that gets to why should one obey God? And it just drives home the point that you can't get an ought from an is, even when it comes to an all-powerful deity. An all-powerful deity says to Cam Spires, do this. Cam says, no, why should I? Why should Cam? Well, because I said so and I created the universe. So? Who cares if you created the universe and you said so? Give me a reason why I should obey you. And, um, and I think even when even when the God says, oh, because I ground morality, it seems like a coherent question to me to ask, oh, you know, well, then why still should I do it? Yeah. And I think most answers will end up driving at pain and pleasure, because if you don't do it, you won't get pleasure. Or if you do, do if you don't obey me, you might get pain. Like this whole idea of, well, you should just do it because you love me. <laughs> it's like. Maybe I'm a cold-hearted guy, but why is that a good enough reason? <laughs> um, like even in a, uh, uh, what's her name? The Greg Kokel uh, woman who, what's her name? Do you mean you know what I'm talking about? Greg Kokel's sidekick? She answers the phones on his show. What was her name? I forget her name, but. Amanda, maybe? I don't know, but she she but yeah, I can't remember. She tried to put me in a tough spot, and she was asking me um, questions like, um, because I asked her the same question: Why is sin bad? Why is disobeying God bad? And she brought it, always brought it back to love, 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 because you want to love God, you want to show that you love God. And um, then she brought it right back to me and my wife, like, why do you want to love your wife? And she wanted me to say it's because I love her for who she is not for what she does. But I stuck to my guns on that because technically I love my wife not for who she is per se, but who she is is mostly what she does. Because if my wife did something, I can imagine things that my wife could do where I would stop loving her. So it's not a matter of I love her who she, because of who she is. I love her by what she does, because she could, imagine the worst case scenario, she could kill my own children. I think I would stop loving my wife at that point. It, so that love is contingent on what she does. And, um, and I'm sure she would do the same. Is that too harsh? So <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Wright points out, uh, her name was Amy. Amy, yes, thank you, thank you. But I know for a lot of people that just sounds so cruel and heartless to put it that way, that we love people based on what they do, not who they are. But I actually believe that. I think it's, do you agree with me that we love people based on what they do and not who they are? 
Um, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the way that I, the way that I would frame it is that, yes, we we love them for who they are, but who they are is derived in like who they are is like a model that we have in the in our brain about another person about their past and actions. then we and we derive our models about other people on the basis of what they do and how they interact, etc. And so like the way in which what you are saying is right is that when people act in certain ways external to us, it can affect our beliefs about those that person. And then, you know, it's like almost like updating our perspective on what that person does. Perhaps we thought previously the person was very trustworthy, but then we see many observations of them doing untrustworthy things. And we sort of change our view about who they are, concluding they're an untrustworthy person on the basis of this. There's one exception. And I, I there's one exception. Not, there is an exception to what I said. And that is, and Joe DiPilato just brought it up. And I think there's an evolutionary, uh, what's the word, attraction to loving people for who they are and not what they do when it comes to um, procreation. And so Joe asked, what about babies? Like, do my baby came into the world, I, they haven't done anything other than cause me trouble and grief <laughs> by crying and having dirty diapers, but I still cherish and love that baby because they have my genes in them or because I have decided to um, care for it if I adopt. So um, somebody I think has, uh, maybe has OCD. They want you, Doug, to take the, this? the cream part of your collar, that side, yep, and then turn it over. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I wanted to make sure everybody could see the Duke Kaboom on this side. Well, Nick, what was the person's name? Uh, Gareed? Jareed? <laughs> Jareed. Jer I don't know how to say this. Okay, name. so Jareed, if you tick me off, I'm going to go like this. But if you're good, I'll go like that. See, I love Jareed based so, on what he does. <laughs> so Salem asks, uh, are you and Cam mythicists or historicists when it comes to Jesus? Oh, can I answer first? I, I've, sure. never, I've never said this on air. I am a mythicist when it comes to Jesus Christ. But I'm a historian. That's evading the question. That's <laughs> evading the question, Doug. <laughs> but I'm a historicist when it comes to Jesus. A tra tra traveling preacher, itinerant. But the Christ? No. I'm a mythicist. I'm, I'm uh, a bit... Uh, toward uh, historicism, but pretty close to agnosticism. Yeah. With respect to the historical Jesus, I, I yeah. <laughs> not not with respect to the, uh, the Christ of faith. With respect to the Christ of faith, I think it's a bunch of garbage. I think it's almost certainly false. If you're an atheist and you ever ask that question, are you a mythicist or a histor historicist? Just ask the question, which Jesus are you talking about? And because if they're talking about the Jesus that walked on water, then if, I'm, if, you, if you're an atheist, I'm assuming that <laughs> you don't believe that. You say, no, I don't believe that Jesus ever existed. But I also think that almost everybody in the chat should not agree with me. <laughs> That's a weird thing to say, but like, I really do think that uh, the right way to go about it as somebody who maybe hasn't read a lot of the literature on the subject is to follow the consensus just in the same way that we do with science. So, um, of course, it is contingent upon the methodologies of this discipline being valid. Uh, that is like that these Jesus scholars, they, um, you know, do need to be using method valid methodologies. But um, as an external observer, your judgment should be very heavily weighted by uh, what a consensus of experts has to say. And in the case of historic, historical Jesus, the overwhelming consensus is in favor of there being a man named Jesus who did exist, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was associated with John the Baptist and effectively started a religion. Well, I mean, call, like was related to the beginnings of a religion. 
Someone said I had a Henry Henley Regatta blazer. This shirt makes it look like I have that. No, no. This shirt doesn't look anything like that. Who said that? <laughs> so tell us more about it. This is like a daredevil costume or something, right? You don't know what this is? Do you, you do not know Duke Kaboom? Well, I heard that he was like really terrible and you, you shouldn't be wearing it because it's embarrassing. <laughs> well, I'm kidding. Toy Story 4, take your kids to see it. You'll understand. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I should do that. Okay, ask us serious questions. Here's your chance. Otherwise, we'll just go off air. Craig asks, uh, what do you think about the definition of salvation? Is God saving us from himself? Oh, you're asking me what I think about that theme or that meme? Um, I agree with it. <laughs> like, why should anybody be saved in the Christian definition of salvation? Seriously, why should anybody be, want to be saved? Safe from what? Safe from sin. Who cares about sin? Why should they be saved from sin? Well, because it saves you from death. Who cares about death? We're going to know everybody dies. You Christian, non-Christian, you're going to die. Well, no, no, we mean the afterlife. What do you mean? Oh, well, there's heaven and hell. Oh, what's hell? Well, f depending on what type of Christian you are, it's either really, really bad or just you're gone or, or it's separation. But yeah, you're saving. And God is the gatekeeper to heaven. So when he doesn't let you into heaven, the default position is hell, which is not heaven. So he's the one who sends you to not heaven by not letting you into heaven. <laughs> so that meme is good. So Joe um, uh, DiPolato asks, for both of you, what would have to happen to make you prefer death? Tremendous pain. Yeah, that's pretty much where I was going to. Um, some type of mental, severe mental anguish, like, um, mental health issues or um, some incredibly painful disease like leukemia or um, yeah, hey, MS. Simon Funk, I'll answer, I'll answer your question in a second, Simon Funk. Um, but I was just going to say that if I was in the situation of my sister paralyzed um, in tremendous pain, yeah, I, she has a feeding tube in her. I, I would never, I'd say, get this feeding tube out, pump me up with drugs, put me in a, uh, in a coma, and uh, say my goodbyes, and that's it. But with my sister, it's like she believes in a God. So this, by the way, this is why there's religion, because it helps survival. Because my sister believes in a God, she believes in miracles, she believes that she's going to be healed someday. And so she has that feeding tube on, and she keeps every day in pain. Evolution worked. <laughs> um, Simon so, Funk asked, oh, you go. asked uh, I enjoyed this debate, but why do you think Jonathan can't see or acknowledge his bias? The same reason all of us can't acknowledge or see our bias sometimes. Uh, but it goes to a deeper level when it comes to deeply held beliefs because it involves love or fear. With Jonathan, I think it's love. He loves Jesus. He really does. And he loves his community of fellow Christians. He loves Jesus. He loves his community. And he loves the idea of having answers to how everything came about. He loves the idea of having meaning, meaning, purpose, and hope in Jesus, going to heaven. So if Tom Jump got through to Jonathan just a little bit that, no, you can explain everything just as well with naturalistic pantheism as you can with uh, general God, <clears throat> then there goes the, prior, <clears throat> there goes the probability to, to help raise the prior probability of Jesus being raised from the dead if, oh, well, maybe there is no God. Yeah then he's sunk and he loses all those things so j a green asks what's been the most difficult argument you've ever faced in countering christianity no uh, none <laughs> no 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 that's that's rude that's rude uh, do you hear that just hang on a second um can you answer that question? There's a CB over there, and it's someone that's caught their frequency. Um, it's, it's not specifically an argument for Christianity, but it's one that has um, made me question my 
uh, naturalistic worldview. And it's an argument that can motivate um, the accepting of uh, non-natural properties. In particular, it's called the rule-following argument as uh, worked on by Wittgenstein and Saul Kripke. Um, but it's not really an argument, for, well, no, it's not at all an argument for Christianity, but uh, the conclusions of it uh, might be more like coherent within um, theistic worldviews. Remind me, what was the question? <laughs> oh, any arguments that... About uh, the Christian most difficult argument in countering Christianity. Um, for Christianity? I think there's a good argument, um, an emotional one, for just that existential angst. I think that is... Um, you know, that meaning, hope, and purpose, that whole idea of living longer than just this life, seeing your loved ones again, it, that can be powerful. But um, Christianity is just so bad. <laughs> I don't know if it can be salvaged. The only way it can be salvaged is if what it purports to have, have happened in the book of Acts it happens again. It's simple, Christians. If you want more Christians, if you really care about evangelism, if you care about other people going to heaven and not going to hell, do the stuff. That please said. get, yeah. Please get Jesus to give you some power to actually do some things that were recorded in the Bible. That would be really useful. Yes, for yes. Salim, I know that that sounds silly, but like, I mean, really, like, if you read the Book of Acts, like. I don't really understand why it is we shouldn't expect those things today. In fact, I mean, it says in the New Testament that Jesus said that you will do greater things than I. And, and it's like, Christians, at some point you're going to have to stop making excuses and saying, well, it, yeah, Jesus said you'll do greater things than I, but he didn't really mean you're going to cast out demons or raise the dead. He really didn't mean that. And, and sure, it says that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be with you also, and whatever you ask in my name, that it will be done. Sure, it says that, but that doesn't really mean that whatever you ask is actually going to happen. It's just whatever he wants to have happen. And at some point, you just got to say, come on, like, we've got to take everything in with a grain of salt now in, in the New Testament? Uh, Pine Creek, do you think that we can have morality without empathy, and isn't it empathy subjective? Um, and that's why we can have objective morality. Do I think we can have morality without empathy? Yes, I actually think you can. I think it can be, I think robots could have um, this idea of empathy. Just the, basically using um, social cues, um, seeing someone in pain, seeing them wince, hearing them say that they're in pain, and saying, oh, that's a signal that I shouldn't do X, so I won't do X. So a robot could do that. Westworld, the, the robots were programmed for certain moral actions, and they didn't. Have oh, that, that that's fiction, Doug. Did oh, you know, uh, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I can't tell the difference. <laughs> so Joe asks. Oh, actually, let's ask Adam's question first. Uh, what do Christians believe are the ways to get to heaven, from the most accepted to least? works, repentance, being elect, etc. Who asked that? Adam does, I see. Oh, okay. I guess then I'll answer. <laughs> uh, no, I got I want to find it. Below. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, the question is, how do Christians, what do they say is how they get to heaven? Okay. The presuppositional reformed Calvinist would say you get to heaven by God choosing you from before the foundations of the universe. And it's nothing that you do. The Armenians or non-Calvinists would say it's um, by confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and taking up your cross and following him. So over a mixture of Paul and James and Jesus. And depending on the Christian, they will be a little bit different on the emphasis on repentance versus just belief. But a true believer will repent. So it's, it's just like an um, incestuous relationship. I've been using that word lately. 
<laughs> incestuous. So, uh, Joe asked, uh, do you think that belief in God can be good for humanity, even if we can't know the truth of it? Yes. That's a simple question for me to answer. Yes. The belief in God can be good, just like it can be dangerous. That's why that debate with R and Ra and, um, and, uh, Michael, what's his last name from Inspiring Philosophy? Uh, I don't know if we meant to say his last name. Oh. Oh, and it just it's Michael Jones. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is public knowledge. But. Yeah, that's why that whole debate was doomed from the start, because of course Christianity is dangerous, and of course it isn't. It's the, depending on how you define it and the situation, the context. And, but yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Skyler just played and reviewed your short winger video during this, his show and praised it, said folks should like and subscribe to you. You ought to go on his... <laughs> yeah, I should go on Skyler's show. But, but Cam, explain to everybody why I don't do much of that. <laughs> You're a maverick. <laughs> you, um, you, you want to have that nice little button in your beautiful convertible that ejects you from the entire vehicle at any time you choose. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to. Well, I guess even on Skylar's show, I could go poof. And then, <laughs> so. Uh, Edgar Akiri, Pine Creek, will you critic, critique David Bentley Hart? Do you know who that is? I'd love to see that. He has a uh, he's a theologian. He uh, made like a new translation of the New Testament. Um, and he is fairly prominent in uh, circles that are willing to like reevaluate what um, what the original like what the language of the original Greek New Testament meant to the authors who wrote it without focusing too heavily on like modern uh theology and presumptions and so he has some form if i recall correctly he he does have some theological views that are a little bit against the grain hey um maybe the answer is maybe edgar um it depends on my endorphin level if i watch start watching something my endorphin levels go up it's a higher probability i'll talk about it but did you watch me critique heiser the other day cam I did, yeah. That was the one that you got some massive like pushback from all the sen Sentinel apologetics folks, right? <laughs> it's like Pine Creek critiques Heiser. Just it's just like it's it's so predictable. Liar! <laughs> yeah, knee jerk reaction. Touch just lying. <laughs> yeah, so I bet you you could just have that heading, that headline, Pine Creek critiques Heiser and without them seeing one second of it, it's straw manning. It's like, <laughs> but I got, yeah, no, you got called worse. You, you got accused of doing worse than that there, Doug. And what's strange is I thought I was agreeing with him, like on 90% of it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's the same thing happened when I critiqued, um, inspiring philosophy. It's like, I agreed with 90% of what he said on the ri rising gods or whatever. And it's like, no, but you're an atheist, so you're the enemy, so um, you're bad. Uh, Frozen Sea asks, Doug, do you think Christianity is more or less dangerous than other popular religions? Or the same? Oh, yeah, let's rank them, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be controversial at all. Well, you do, all you have to do is take them by size. Because if you if Hitchens was right, if Christopher Hitchens was right, then if all if religion is dangerous, no, what do you say? Poisons everything. Then you just go Christianity would be the worst, Islam number two, um, Hinduism number three, and then you just go down the list. But uh, Joe De Palato asked, which is the um, best form of Christianity? I would. Uh, you've heard my answer on this, Joe. It's uh, Pete Enns' version. Yeah, though, you're so attracted and reverent toward these uh, very hyper-literalist Cal Calvinists, right? 
yeah hang on this is the, this is the version of christianity you want to succeed whereas the other one is the version of christianity that you think is more likely to be correct tom jump is here hey tom you want to hop in and um i i got i got something to tell you you did something really wrong in that debate Uh, let me give you a link. But yeah, I'm all for Pete Inns' version of Christianity taking over. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I want to make it really clear that... Uh, do I say this? Yeah. Atheism is not for everyone. <laughs> no, I know we can't always choose what we believe. We can put ourselves in situations where we're more likely to believe things rather than not. But... Um, some people uh, just can't survive without eternity in mind. Is that true? Do you think I'm right about that? Uh, it's, it's a pretty... Um, some people, that's a pretty light claim, Doug. You're yeah. going to have to go for something a bit more than that. You know, there could just be like one deranged guy down the road, and that claim would be true. So, You want me to be more dogmatic? Yeah, you you did put put your neck out there, but okay. Some people are so weak and insecure and needy that they need Jesus. That's <laughs> is that better? <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was better. That's like something worthy of critique. Hey, Tom. And I oh, really, no. and I really, what happened? Tom, come back. Oh, here he comes. I think maybe something was going wrong on his side. Oh yeah, his um. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, I wasn't picking up my mic there for a minute. Okay, uh, this how you doing? Is pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, you guys know each other. Um, what you did wrong, I, we went through the whole debate, and then what you got wrong was the cross examination of John. Right, because I didn't actually ask him any questions; just let him ask the questions. Yeah. Did you hear me say that, or did you figure that out on your own? <laughs> oh, no, I already knew that. Like, I just got home, like, a few minutes ago. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I did, I did that intentionally. I, there was not really much many questions I wanted to ask him. I was pretty much okay with him guiding oh, no, the no, questions. No, no, no. You take that. Don't give that opportunity up. you got to take it. Seize it. you got to ask, poof or drown, Jonathan, if, if, even but if it's Doug, unrelated to the debate. Consider this rhetorically, though. If he does so well and he didn't even take all of his opportunities how much more does it look that he won look like he won i don't know i like you could have even asked him please define god for me because you notice not once he defined it he alluded to certain things like all powerful all loving but he never once gave a definition of this generic theism remember he said generic he wasn't well, please let us know what generic theism is, Jonathan. Like, that would be a good yeah, question. Yeah, I think that... But I think, though, Tom, you did really well with, like, pointing out how it is the case that the space of possible gods is much larger than this narrow little band that he selected that makes predictions about what the world would be like. Right, well, that was kind of the entire point of my argument was that if he's going to simply just define out all of the other alternative possibilities, as atheists, we can just do the same thing and say, well, just define out the other possible universes, and this is the only possible universe because of some super law or whatever, and we get the same probabilities. Yeah. So I, I was mentioning earlier in the chat that I liked how you jumped into his epistemological framework, even though it's something that you don't actually accept. Yeah, I... I think that is fundamentally flawed. I don't think Bayesian epistemology can be applied to things that aren't empirical. But even if I accept it, it still doesn't work because he's just defining all of the alternatives out of existence to make his seem more plausible, which just doesn't work. Yeah. Now, Tom, you're good, but you're not that good. Because what you should have done is you should have used that first slide that Jonathan put up and did this. <laughs> did what? Here, I'll, I know it's small. Let me read it to you. This is what I did like five minutes before I came live stream tonight. I took his slide, you know, the, all the steps to go from the universe to a moral arena, whatever he called it. 
and, yeah. just, and just say, what's the probability of this universe with all its wasted space, black holes, dark matter, given theism? Ah, well, let's be generous. Give it 0.1%. What's the probability that only 4% of the universe is far, far less life-permitting, given theism? Ah, well, let's be generous. Give it 0.1%. And just keep going down. The last one is, what's the probability uh, that a volcano or a hurricane can kill thousands of people at a random given theism? Ah, uh, let's be generous and give it 0.1%. Well, and what, wouldn't you know it, when you multiply all these things together, you get less than 1 times 10 to the negative 24 probability of theism. We're back to square one, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he'd probably just argue, but oh, but we have excuses for all of those things. Exactly, but <laughs> yeah. let him... Yeah, oh yeah, that's definitely true. They, and in fact, there's probably Christians typing to me right now in the comments, like, because I said that earlier. They're giving, well, no, no, but we can explain why this and why, because there's problems with suffering, well, it's because he had moral sufficient reasons, blah, blah, blah. But though, Tom, you do actually understand why it is the case that when they make that move in the game of providing excu excuses within the Bayesian framework, it does actually still have the same associated cost as what the evidence would have been in the first place. Right. Unless they specifically try and define that out of their math, which is what they're probably going to do. They're probably going to say that there's some special exclusion case where it doesn't really apply in that same sense. Yeah, well, I, what I find that they do is they say, oh, no, there are these like, you know, very tight, simple properties. And from that, we can derive these things all as like entailments. And then like you, you try to check their work and it's just hand waving. Yeah, exactly. OK, so this is Monday morning quarterbacking. But uh, early on in the video, John, Jonathan talked about, you remember that s single celled thing going life going to a, a multi or celled organism right and he was basically right. saying atheism he didn't use the word explain but basically said atheism can't explain that without uh a th god with foresight or something like that um you mean the part where he was doing the probabilities and he said this occurring on atheism is extremely improbable right because you need a god with foresight he basically he used the word foresight i would have pounced on that and saying how exactly does foresight explain it well, I think that's the same as the design argument. You need some kind of design or intentionality. Yeah, it, but it, and and you just kept hammering home to him that this is an argument for from ignorance, um, which it was. Let's see. Oh, and did you catch that? Have you watched it since you did it? Uh, yeah, at like multiple times speed though, so I'm not sure if I caught it. Okay. Did you catch that on two occasions he admitted that? morality is presupposed that objective morality is presupposed that without a god you can't have it right that was one of the questions you asked in the q a um yeah. i don't i didn't know that there was a second time though he actually used the word presuppose twice and so here's a evidentialist trying to give an an uh, evidential type argument using that word twice well i think the argument is that he presupposes that there is a being who is moral and then using that as the starting point he says given this being that we presuppose a universe that we see around us has this probability so i think he's intentionally presupposing those as just the properties of the god as a starting point and then in two um i think this is true but in two timestamps at fifty fifty one and at oh uh, i don't know the other one he at one point he agreed with you that you can divide up the probability for theism by all the different versions of God. Yeah. And then by the end, he disagreed with you. No, you can't do that. I don't right. Know he, he said, you could do that, but those aren't actually gods. We're only talking about the actual kind of God, which is how I define it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think those are the big points. Your best part was your second rebuttal to him. And your closing statement. If anybody missed Tom's debate with Jonathan, watch this, his second rebuttal from uh, 5344 to 5541 and his closing statements from one twenty, uh, an hour 22 to an hour 24. Because uh, I think Tom does a really good job of basically summarizing what I call the outsider test for deism. And use it, because Tom is just one man. Cam is just one man. I'm just one man. But if the whole world was to use these arguments, this, this type of dare I say rhetoric, it's like, it's powerful. 
that's like an evolution in a game where you have a new strategy and it just completely overwhelms the other team and then they're going to have to adapt in some way to get a new strategy. I kind of see this whole big debate between theism and atheism as just a giant like a chess game with different strategies being deployed. Do you think it's yeah. going to, you think it's ever going to go away? Yeah, I think that it's going to diffuse to such a degree that it's going to be unable to be uh, coherent to the broader public. And if the broader public loses interest, it's going to lose funding and it's going to die out. Yo, I I'm, I'm kind of think that it's already getting close to that, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it started with Darwin. Literature and it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, Darwin with his uh, Origin of Species made a huge impact on how it was no longer accepted at the time period because of his work. And that that was essentially the major stepping stone in moving away from the theism. And we just keep going further and further. And as somebody said, like philosophy is the last bastion of theology. Yeah, we're definitely not ready for it, though. We're not ready for society in the United States is not ready for Christianity to leave. Well, it's not clear to me that um, that philosophy and apologetics is doing any type of positive influence in maintaining numbers in churches. It's that's not clear. Maybe it is the case, but um, it's not clear to me, at least. Oh yeah, I totally agree. It's completely secondary, but uh, it it only survives because there are people in the churches who give money to these organizations, like the Templeton Foundation. And as soon as that dries up, then these will follow as just like a dominoes. Yeah. But so, but I would say that the atheists like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, who argue against the theists, do a really good job of decreasing the amount of people who go to church. I think so too. Yeah, which is why I think there was such a forceful reaction against them. Yeah, and I that's just, kind of my goal. My goal is to be like them. Yeah, I want to. So I'll say one thing. Okay, here we go. It's, it's time to pump up Tom's head. I remember jumping into a, a private hangout with you. And I remember you making the claim to me. Uh, I think it was both the claim that you have the goal of influencing the field of academic philosophy. Right. Yeah. And I think you also made the claim that, like, you wanted to, uh, like, you know, influence the public sphere in in your pursuit of influencing academic philosophy as well. And I actually thought that that was kind of silly. I thought that you were like really overconfident. And I thought that um, that there was almost like some type of uh, like Dunning-Kruger thing going on where um, uh. I, I thought I thought that there was a really low chance of this being the case, but I've watched you. I've watched you over the last six months or however long it is. And I've seen you talk with many philosophers um, and people who are competent and that have, you know, been trained and they've gone, um, you know, perhaps even published papers, et cetera. And I really think that you do well, like, and you've made some of them reconsider positions, hopefully, and, or at least those ones who are in the pursuit of, you know, truth and really are open to revising their positions. I think you've had an influence. Um, and thank you. That's a really amazing compliment. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah so pu publish that book. That's Working a, on it. That's a really good compliment, Cam. Now, now do me. <laughs> <laughs> Doug has the most beautiful hair. It's, just, it's so nice and silky. Don't make me poof you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doug, I think you've you've probably got the best rhetoric in the game. <laughs> that's right. Um, I'll take and, over drone. That's pretty good. I like that one. The library and, one. Library one's pretty good. With the you got to imagine like, would you put this into the fiction section or the nonfiction section? I like that's a good one. I really well, like. Cam that doesn't one. like the where I went with that one, but uh, but yeah, I like it too. Well, I'll claim ownership of that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first version, not this. The, I've I've really changed. It. Oh, the new and improved one. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but Doug, I think that uh, that you your understanding of christianity through your own personal experience has given you like a insight like a, a window into the psychology of a lot of fellow christians and i think that you uh abuse that for your own nefarious <laughs> purposes <laughs> well the thing is it's so hard because i get positive feedback when i when, what i mean by positive feedback is anger from christians 
to me that's positive feedback because I know that if if it was just out there and I was totally wrong, they wouldn't care. Um, just hang on, I'm getting a ransomware target. Oh, oh, that's just a warning. But anyhow, um, bring, bring on the bring on those dislikes, right, Doug? <laughs> but yeah, I, I think a lot of Christians get upset with me when I I say things like, "Well, many times I've said I I know what you're thinking," and like I did that with Cameron Bertuzzi very early on, and went, by I did it with the questions I was asking him, like, and I asked him, "Why is leaving Christianity bad?" And remember that Cam, like back in the the SC Facebook, he was there. And it's like he would he would not go there for the life of him because I think at that time I sized him up correctly and I said for him it was about feeling stupid and not going to hell. His brother made him feel stupid. He didn't like that. Christianity, it's true. We don't want to go to hell. We got to protect the fold and and make money while you're doing it. And uh, and I called him out on those things. And it's like and I think hearing some of the things he said in the past I think I was right so just a shout out to camera Patuzzi um, <laughs> oh if you if you hit on over I mean Doug might be just absolutely livid that I'm using his channel in this way but if you hit on over to capturing Christianity uh, after this you'll find a debate between Graham Oppie and Ed Fazer, which I haven't seen yet but probably worthy of watching for those philosoph like philosophical kinds out there. Is that going on right now? Uh, it may be finished, um, but it started earlier today. Oh. I don't know. But I like Cameron. Leave now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. Doug and Cameron have like a, like a rival kind of relationship. I really like Cameron. He's always been nice to me, uh, in our conversations over Facebook. <laughs> I don't know. Where's this I don't going? Know, I don't know what it is about Doug. <laughs> Doug just rubs him the wrong way, I guess. <laughs> I rub you the wrong way or Cam, Cam the wrong way? Cam, Cameron. Well, so I, I mean, you know, this is psychoanalyzing or like making causal inferences that are probably not warranted to. But I kind of think it was our association with street epistemology that really got his, um, his ire. Um, and I think that he has pretty much like a blanket rejection, uh, and, you know, distrust of any person who pursues, um, you know, questioning, uh, deeply held beliefs as like the primary mode of, um, discussion. And well, I think it's more like the, like the second or third question that, uh, street epistemologist asks is like, how do you verify that? Or how do you know that's not just something in your imagination? And w when you're asking for that kind of empirical verification, it just immediately just theism is gone. It's just, it's done now. You can just throw it in the garbage. And so it completely invalidates his entire position. Yeah. I mean, he would, he would try to maintain that there are like a priori arguments that can get their dedu deductive arguments, methods outside of the empirical sciences that can get you there. But yeah. Um, but then he also like maintains that you can argue from the resurrection as well. But <laughs> I, Cameron's Bertuzzi has admitted that he's not good on his feet like on a live debate situation. So he, he would never do it, I don't think, um, unless he's with someone else maybe, or if it was uh, in written form where he has time to think about it. This is why he was, I'm gonna use the word terrified to talk with me. It's like, and even Cam, like when he, he would do everything in his power, cause he would just assume everything's a trap. And so he has to be so careful I've said this before in past live streams, but I'll say it again here if there's any Christians listening. Embrace the trap. Seriously, if, you believe what, if what you believe is true, don't be scared. And who cares if Cam or me or Tom can make you look stupid? Who cares? You got Jesus on your side, you're going to die and go to heaven. Who cares if Tom Chump is going to make you look like a fool? Well, and the gospel appears foolish to those who are per perishing, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that verse. I love it. I love I get using, it right. I'm not sure if I did. The gospel, the gospel is foolishness to all those who are perishing. Uh, I love saying that verse to Christians who view themselves as intelligent, well-read, um, that they have great articulate reasons to believe. And I'm here to tell you, Christians, if you believe your own New Testament, 
and you're one of those intelligent Christians, please know that you have to take your New Testament seriously when it says that it's foolishness to guys like Tom and Cam and me. Because we're perishing, right? <laughs> See, it's stuff like this that, you know, where you can throw out their own scriptures back at them. And then God often uses the weak to humble the, the, the strong. He uses the foolish to humble the wise. Christians, you need to be weak. You need to be foolish. You need to admit your neediness. Because in that situation, God can use you for powerful means. See, now, this is what I, like, Christians are listening and they, they know what I'm saying is true, but they don't like to hear it because they don't want to be, feel like they're weak and foolish and they want to be Lambs, <laughs> believe like a child. Yeah. So if someone asked me, uh, what would lower my confidence? I guess lower my confidence. In, in what? In what? I don't in, know. In Tom Jump. <laughs> oh, um... I want to see Tom get uh, absolutely destroyed by uh... Ray Comfort. <laughs> yeah, Ray Comfort. That, that that would lower my confidence in Tom, confidence in Tom's uh, ability to persuade the academic field. <laughs> I actually got a couple of big philosophers coming on. Ooh, that's exciting. Who have you got? Paul Copen. Oh, wow. That's cool. Uh, Ozzy, we're setting something up for September. And Ozzy, Ozzy Mandius the mm -hmm. second, Ramses the second. Christopher Hitchens' brother, Peter Hitchens. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, he does the apologetics trick, right? Mm -hmm. um, they had a debate, which is pretty interesting. The Hitchens' are, brother debate. What are the? Um, what's the timeline for those? Uh, Hitchens is supposed to be next Wednesday. Uh, Paul, we don't have a specific date yet. I just heard from him today. I got a response from him today. And then Ozzy is September sometime. Awesome. And uh, I know that this is like a giant incest incestuous community, but uh, where can they find you, Tom? Uh, YouTube.com slash T-Jump. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I just got I just got approved for YouTube monetization. I'm like, yes. Oh, congratulations. Oh, awesome. Now you'll be making tens and tens of dollars. Right. Now it's got those live chats. Those live chats are awesome. This community has the best subscribers ever. They give so much. They're so, so generous, so, char so charitable. These guys are awesome. I love the atheist community. You guys are the best. Oh, yeah. And thank, uh, so you, thank you again for the people who donated to this live stream. Uh, if I didn't see you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the guy was actually asking me what would lower my confidence in street epistemology. Um, I don't know. Like, do you mean like it's effectiveness at sort of getting people to consider their beliefs? Um, I guess like some kind of empirical study would be useful, but um, I actually don't really, I'm not really an advocate of SE. I think that it's worthwhile doing what Tom, Tom does where you actually take a positive you, position. What did you just say? <laughs> um i mean i think it's a good method for like creating dialogue with a lot of openness and uh i think it raises <laughs> i think that <laughs> I, I think that approach uh like has a higher probability that the person will be open to belief revision and self-reflection um but <laughs> that's in the moment i also think that like ridicule and things like that can actually produce br <laughs> hey doug <laughs> you, you gotta earn it buddy I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so are you a SE advocate i didn't know that doug. yes i'm you see, oh oh see here we go i mean i always thought that you weren't one to belong to tribes but SE is a tribe you asked if i'm an advocate that doesn't necessarily mean i'm in the tribe <laughs> Actually, can I can I answer the question that he asked? So, from my perspective, what would lower my confidence in street epistemology would be if it led to complete skepticism of everything. If you could apply it to anything, if you get no reasonable justification, then I would say street epistemology is just completely useless at that point. 
Well, that's the thing, though, is that I don't really consider street epistemology to be an epistemic method. It's a conversational tool. Um, and I think that that's one of the primary confusions that comes about when people interact with the community, is they think what street epistemology is, is an epistemology. No, it's a, it's a dialectical method. It's a method of conversation that enables people to examine beliefs and ideas in an open and safe environment, hopefully. Um, and the use of particular um, strategies of communication that enable those uh, belief revision processes. And um, so... I don't really think it's a, an epistemology, and I think that that's a confusion. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like, if it turned out that, like, by using, uh, by having a conversation with somebody in an essay style, people who held true beliefs and were justified in holding them, if they were, like, convinced out of their beliefs as a result of questioning, that seems just like a really bad thing to do to people. I like it. Yeah, but you, you you're just a you just like tribes, Doug. That's what's really going on there. You just like to cheer. You like to cheerlead for a team. What well, what happened? That explains to, I, the I'm, shirt. I'm taking your maverick badge seriously. <laughs> no longer will you be a maverick. I don't. Know, I think that shirt has some really good cheerleader colors. The the white and the orange. I like it. You guys do realize which channel you're on right now, right? <laughs> oh, that's the end of a stream. Nobody will watch this. <sighs> no, we both get shrunken heads. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm normal size again. Thanks, Doug. No, SE is a very useful tool, I think, for people who want to have productive conversations about sensitive topics. That's the way I view it. Um, but I would encourage everybody out there to develop the ability to take a positive position about things with respect to religion or whatever it is that you believe and that you care about. And don't use SE as a method to avoid adopting a burden of proof and making positive assertions. Because I think as well, one of the primary negative reactions towards street epistemology is the perception that it's a way of avoiding making positive claims. And I think that we as atheists or agnostics, we should be in the business of making positive claims and making defenses for them. Because it's easy. Watch Tom. Watch, watch Doug. Just l understand the arguments that they make and then employ them. And that's all you need to do. Are you saying I make a lot of positive claims? Yeah, I think you make enough. Yeah, I wouldn't characterize it as a lot, but I I do once in a while. That's why I'm not fearful of anyone in a debate or in a conversation. I don't debate, but in a conversation is because <clears throat> I don't have anything to lose like so a lot of other people. Um, I'm not doing this for money. Um, I'm 40-some years old. I'm... I got more less life ahead of me than I got behind me. <laughs> I don't care too much what people think of me. If someone wants to make me look stupid, that's fine. If I if someone asks me a question, have you read such and such? I'm more than happy to say no, I haven't. Someone says, do you know this theory? I say no. But can I ask you a couple of questions? Do you believe Jesus drowned babies? <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> Uh, I appreciated your recent uh, like snippet of Mike Winger ooh. in that past discussion about flood drown, drowning babies. Oh, did you watch it, Tom? Yeah, the part where you said like uh, where he brought up the case of like a uh, uh, an assaulter. And he said, "Well, would you poof or drown the assaulter?" And and you said you'd poof him. And he said, no, no, you should drown him because he deserves to be drowned. <laughs> yeah, this thing, like, uh, there's a really strong sense of, um, what is it called? Like, retributive justice within Christian mindsets. And, you know, I actually, like, reject that, kind of, that whole thing. I think that when we develop methods that can change people in such a way that they act as moral agents and aren't antisocial, I think that we should employ those methods instead of, like, killing people and <laughs> poofing people and like you know poofing people is like the best way 
to deal with a problem when you want to kill somebody. But, you know, the ideal is that you don't have to kill them and you actually restore them to being moral human beings who can engage in society successfully. Yeah, I really like Sam Harris's dialogue on that where he talks about how the, like, the Texas shooter had the brain tumor, which caused him to do all those things, and removing the brain tumor would cure him of the disease, and the same there was a sexual predator for the same thing. He had a brain tumor which caused it, and removing that caused him to be a normal human being in society again. It seems like we shouldn't ever have that retributive justice. It should be always a cure people of the ailment that's causing that kind of damage to them. We shouldn't ever try and hold it against them like there's some kind of soul that they have earned this punishment and it's their fault in some way. It's just not. It's just unrealistic. Exactly. Yeah, like what is it about this person that is causing them to engage in such antisocial behavior and can we fix it? That's a better question. I, uh, is it bad of me? I actually felt a little bad uh, about... I didn't feel bad. You know what? I didn't feel bad about putting it up. But after I saw the comments start flowing in on the Mike Winger one, I uh, started going, oh, my goodness, he's getting destroyed. And I guess rightly so, but, like, I can't imagine that being me. And at some point, Mike Winger's going to see that video, if he hasn't already, and he's going to start scrolling through those comments. And actually, Mike, if you ever watch this, don't do it. Stay away. Don't even open that video. Um, you want to forget that. <laughs> But, yeah, it's... I don't know. I think I think Mike's been long, uh, long, around long enough to know that YouTube comments and Twitter comments are all cancer. I think I think he knows. No, but some of those you comments... You hear that, folks? You're all cancer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... It... That was such a slam dunk at the end there that it's like he can see clear as a bell. He would poof the kids in his thought experiment, but it's like it. He he was the epitome of a slave. He's the epitome of a a slave saying yes, master. Whatever you say, master. If you want to drown my children, go ahead, master. I'll do whatever you want, master. It's like it is the utmost sickness, and uh, he showed it clears a bell there. It's like the story of Abraham and his son. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, antisocial, I mean, I'm not going to be able to give like some really adequate definition, but I don't mean antisocial in the sense that you're a person who doesn't want to engage socially. Antisocial more means uh, engaging in behaviors that harm people in the social sphere. So like antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy. Yeah. Uh, Adam S.E. asked do, if I have any new thought experiments that I'm working on. There was one that I just put on Twitter a while back. I forget what it was, though. It must not have been very good because I forget what it is. But I think uh, when I did this video with, of Mike Winger that I put up yesterday, I was reminded of a thought experiment I did, have done with him. And I don't think I've done it with anybody else, but it's the question, would you rather have Jesus in the flesh or just spiritual? So in other words, would you rather have this personal relationship with Jesus as he, as, as um, Matthew did or as Peter did, as portrayed in the New Testament, or would you just have what you have now? And almost all, every Christian is going to say, oh, yeah, having that with Peter, you know, in the flesh is better. And then when you really go down the road of why exactly is it better, and it just shows that it weakens their relationship that they currently have, the idea of it, that it, maybe it, it's not, not even existent. Maybe it's just made up in my mind. And um, so I should use that more. So yeah, Christ, uh, non-Christians, if you're listening and someone's t telling you about their personal relationship with Jesus, ask them that question. Would you rather have been like Peter and see Jesus in the flesh? He's still God, but he's in the flesh. Or what you have now? And they'll say, well, no, yeah. And then that's wise. And it's about hearing, touching, hugging um well so let's i mean not considering the personal relationship side of things but like let's just take the hypothesis seriously for a little bit 
I would I want the fleshy Jesus because the resurrected fleshy Jesus is made of some type of supernatural substance. He is some type of transformed spiritual body that we want to test as science as scientists because i assume it's not made of like regular stuff but yet somehow it is the case that the apostles saw him with their eyes so what it, it was it using smotons or botons or was it using photons and if it was using photons then what was jesus made out of you know why Fuzzy you know. jesus <laughs> Fuzzy jesus someone clipped that <laughs> Cam Spires, I want the fleshy Jesus. <laughs> so uh, I'm channeling, um, I'm channeling, ch channeling, uh, uh, Caven there, you know, from Caven and Col Columbetti, the guys. Oh, if you haven't seen, um, if you haven't seen the debate, there's this really excellent debate somewhere on YouTube with, Gr I think it's Greg Caven, um, on the resurrection of Jesus. the music you guys can't hear it but we got two minutes left so if anybody has last minute questions how do you spell caven uh, c-a-c-a-v-i-n i want the fleshy jesus too getting back to uh what we started with yeah you did a very good job tom on the debate um, for people who don't know, Jonathan, I think is a PK, a preacher's kid. I think he's. I don't think Tom, uh, Jonathan remembers a time when he wasn't a Christian. I think that's true. And so he this. He's working is, on his PhD in cell biology. It's pretty cool. He's been doing that ever since I've known him, and <laughs> and I've known him for what three years now. I don't know. Takes a while. Yeah. Thanks, Salim. Mine Onion says, T Jump, sometimes I borrow your arguments. Hope that's okay. Yes, it's okay, Mine Onion. Yeah, I hope everyone does. We are. Oh, Tom, just a little bit of a praise. Like, I am on like audio conversations with people quite a bit, and I do see people starting to use um, a lot of what you say. Awesome. It's uh, inspiring. Yeah, we've got some some good good old imitation going on. I imitation with understanding. Thievery is the best form of flattery. Thanks, Chris Simmons. Chris, quit beating up on me in the chat, in the comments. Thanks, Jordan. like a bowling shirt. No, it's not a bowling shirt. It's a Duke Kaboom shirt. It's always backwards. And, and Gerard, Gerard, this is for you. I, I'm going to get you some pop culture wares, Doug. <laughs> I, I, think, I think this reference Poof. is lost on people. <laughs> <laughs> it's on Toy Story 4, for goodness sakes. Poof. Poof. And it did very well in the box office. Good night, everyone. See y'all. See ya.